Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Yobosa has said, my name is Bosa Laurenti, and today um, I'm presenting this topic, electricity in the heart, the basic principles behind electrocardiography. We're going to make this session as interactive as possible. You can see a QR code here. Uh, you can scan that code. It's, it's going to take you to a site. If you don't have a QR scanner, you can copy. Um, you can copy um, this um, website address because uh, I'm going to ask some questions. There's one I'm going to do now, and it's already open. So if you go to the site, you will see the question there. I just want to have an assessment of our knowledge base. So I'll, if you put in your answer there, then I'll be able to show the results later. But in the meantime, um, let's continue with the lecture. Okay. So the first question we're going to answer today is what is electrocardiography? Now, um, electrocardiography is the process of producing an electrocardiogram. Normally, when you're reading, you will see this in short form ECG, or sometimes you will see it uh, as EKG. They are the same thing. There's no difference. So an electrocardiogram is uh, a recording of the heart's electrical activity. Basically, it's a graph of voltage against time. And then it shows the amplitude of the voltage that is being recorded from the human heart. Now, um, we need to know that our nerves and muscle cells, they communicate with each other using electrical and chemical signals. We're going to talk more about this later. And um, for our hearts to beat, to continue beating, we need to have regular electrical signals that that comb, that helps the heart to beat that gives the heart the signal that it should beat so when we are talking about ecg signals they are sent by a group of cells in the heart uh, it's congregated in what we call the sinoatrial node and um, so this 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 sinoatrial node is like a trigger like a pacemaker for the heart and once it triggers the signals they generate, they spread through the heart muscles as tiny electrical pulses. Normally we call these pulses action potentials. So before we go too much into details, um, let's look at a, a few facts about the heart. Um, the first is that, I think we all know this, that the heart is a muscle, um, it's roughly, the size of your fist. Of course, you know it's uh, located in your chest cavity and it's tilted slightly to the left. Now, on the average, your heart beats about 72 times per minute. And if you were to calculate that in a day, that would be about 100,000 times in a day. So you can see that your heart is a workhouse. It's doing a lot of work. So um, per minute, your heart pumps between five to six liters of blood. And um, it does this through what we call the circu circulatory system, which is a network of blood vessels, you know, arteries, capillaries, veins. And so um, as the heart beats, it also relaxes. And then that continuous action circulates blood throughout your body. And it's by that means that you're able to receive oxygen and nutrients. Uh, and also the, the, the carbon, uh, the carbon um, uh, dioxide that you, you have used up in your body is taken out of the body and then it also removes the waste. Now the heart has three layers. We have the pericardium which is the outer covering of the heart. It also serves as a protective layer for the heart. And then we have the myocardium. In, in, in uh, medical terms, you will see that most of the time when uh, medical professionals want to talk about the heart, they will call it the myocardium. So, but the myocardium is the, um, 
the second layer, it's a thick muscular layer and uh, it does the work. That's, the, that's where the contraction and the relaxation happens. And then finally, we have the endocardium, which is a thin inner layer, which lines the cavities inside the heart. We will look at the structure of the heart in the moment so that we can look at, we refresh ourselves because I know that most of us, when, maybe when we were in secondary school, we had a basic knowledge of biology and uh, we'll look at that. Now, um, the heart weighs approximately between 250 to 350 grams. So that just gives you an indication of, you know, a, a little bit about how your heart is structured. Now, um, we have the heart anatomy and um, you can see, this is like a bisection of the heart and um, the heart has a left side and it has a right side. And this is the right side. And on each side, we have two chambers. We have the two chambers, we have the atria and then we have the ventricles. So here, on the right side, it is the right side that receives the oxygenated blood from the body. And it does that through this artery. We call it, it the superior vena cava. This is the artery that does that. And then when the uh, superior vena cava receives the oxygenated blood, the blood flows into the right atrium. We can see the arrow here. And then there is a valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay, because now we have the two ventricles here and the atria, atria, the, the atria there. So the tricuspid valve is like a tap. It, 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 it closes the valve and then it, sometimes the valve opens when the blood needs to flow from atria into the ventricles and it can close also. Apart from that, it also serves like um, an insulation between the atria and the ventricles. So here we have the tricuspid valve. And then um, on the other side, there's also a valve that does the same function. We call this the mitral valve, okay? So when blood flows from the atria, it goes through the tricuspid valve on the right side into the, into the right ventricle. Then the right ventricle pushes the blood into the pulmonary artery the pulmonary artery carries the oxygenated blood to the lungs. So when the blood gets to the lungs, it gets oxygenated, and then the blood returns back to the heart through the pulmonary vein. Now the pulmonary vein um, pull, uh, pulls the blood into the left atrium. The blood flows through the mitral valve on the left side of the heart, and then flows into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle pushes the blood into the aorta. And then from the aorta, the blood is pumped to all the organs of the body. So basically, this is how, how uh, it works. So I'm going to, I want to see what we have done. Just give me a minute. I want to see, um, what we have done with the other prayer. Okay. Okay. So now I, can you see that? This is uh, the result of what we did, the polling that we did. So 40% of us, we know nothing. And then, well, and this is good. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation. Okay. All right, now we're going to watch a short video of um, our hard work, uh, just a summary of what I have said. So just let's, let's just listen and watch. In a healthy person, the heart is responsible for providing the body with blood that has been resupplied with oxygen so that the body can continue to function. It's a continuous process. On the right side of the heart, the right atrium, the heart receives deoxygenated blood from the body. 
the blood passes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and then is pumped through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery, which takes the deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. This oxygen-rich blood comes back into the left atrium of the heart through the pulmonary veins. The blood passes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which pumps the blood out through the aortic valve into the aorta. This is the main artery that takes this oxygen-rich blood to all the different parts of the body. Once the body has used all the oxygen from the blood, it is pumped back into the right side of the heart and the process continues. Within the healthy heart, there is a partition called the septum that divides the two sides of the heart and prevents the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood from mixing. With every heartbeat, the valves in the heart open to allow the blood to flow freely in one direction, but they then close completely to prevent any blood from leaking backwards. Okay, so that's like a summary of what happens in our hearts, just to show how the blood flows. So one thing I'm going to mention is the cardiac output, uh, because this is a very important um, factor that um, is considered when we're talking about um, the, the flow of blood in the heart. So this is simply, cardiac, uh, the cardiac output is simply the amount of blood your heart pumps every minute. So, um, and th this equation rep represents um, this, um, this function. Um, so it's simply the stroke volume multiplied by your heart rate. Now your stroke volume is just the amount of blood your heart pumps each time it beats. And then your heart rate is the number of times your heart beats per minute, which can vary depending on what you're doing. So a normal cardiac output, I've just put that as a note, it, it, for a normal person, you, your, your, your cardiac output should be between five to six liters of blood every minute. That is when the person is resting. Now we also, uh, we'll just take a, a, a close look at this. Um, the factors affecting our heart rate, and then factors affecting stroke volume. You can see a number of um, uh, factors affecting our heart rate here. So you, 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 you need to like fitness level age and so on. And then the stroke volume, you would be surprised to know that gender has something to do with it. Um, so uh, I think men have, they, they're able to, they have more output in that terms than, than, than women. So, so this is just um, um, to show you what that does. And then secondly, in, the, in this one, we can see, we're talking about physiological heart rate, okay? And this shows a number of conditions that can affect the heart. Now, for example, and all of them, they have significance when you're talking about your cardiac output. For example, here we have bradycardia. Now this is a condition that for a normal heart, when your heart beats, you should have between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So, but for a condition called bradycardia, what you have is that your heart will be beating below 60 beats per minute. It is too slow. It beats like the, the frequency is too low. And then when you have tachycardia, tachycardia is a condition where your heart beats above 100 beats per minute. And these are, um, they are not normal conditions. So all of these, they have an effect on your cardiac output. So um, let's just go to the next slide. Now, Having said that, we're not going to go into the conducting system of the heart, and this is where we, we look at how ECG waves are formed. Now, um, one thing we need to know is that our heart, the, the muscle cells in our heart, they are polarized. I'm talking about each of the cells. The cells are polarized, and they have an effective negative value when at rest. When you're at rest, you're not doing anything. You are, you're not doing any forms of exercise or moving about. Now, we, why this is so is because we have an excess of positive sodium ions. I'm, I'm sure we all did chemistry when we were in school. 
So um, there's an excess for each cell. There's an excess of positive sodium ions outside of the membranes of the cell. So because we have a, a net positive charge outside of the membranes of the cell, the, um, the constitution of the inside of the cell has an effective negative, negative charge. Now, the cells of the heart will depolarize. When I say, so I want you to know two terms. I'm going to be mentioning depolarization and repolarization. When I say depolarization, it simply means that the heart, the effect it will have on the heart when your heart depolarizes is that your heart contracts. And then when your heart repolarizes, it simply means that that is the point when your heart is relaxing. So contracting and relaxing, we said it's depolarizing and repolarizing. So, and it doesn't need an outside stimulus to do this. And this is the property of the heart we call automaticity or autorhythmicity, that it's, it's self-sufficient in itself to generate what the stimulus that it needs. And that's why the sinoatrial node is very important in the functioning of our heart. Now, we have, um, Another thing is we have a network of specialized cardiac muscle cells, which form the conducting system of the heart. And uh, they are responsible for initiating and distributing electrical pulses that contract the heart. For, for physics students here, and possibly uh, students in engineering, if they are here, um, when, you know, when you're talking about electrical, for example, an electronic um, device, will not work if you do not plug it into a socket so that electricity can flow through. So this is the same way it works for the heart if you want to get it pumping. So um, more on this, um, I talked about sodium ions earlier. So I said that the, the reason why um, sodium ions are congregated outside of the membranes of the heart is because the, the, the cells of the heart, are, uh, they are relatively impermeable to sodium ions. So um, for, for, the, for electricity, for, we need pulses of like for um, depolarization to happen. What happens is that the heart cells are stimulated. When they are stimulated, the, the level of permeability that they have is increased and so, the sodium ions are able to enter. Um, I, I know that there's this thing they say that uh, like charges, they repel and um, unlike charges, they attract. I told you earlier that the inside of the cells, ha they, have, has, they have an effective negative value. So when the permeability um, is increased, the sodium ions enter the cells to neutralize the negative ions. And this is just something that happens in, in an instant. So when they enter, the, 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 the uh, negative ions are neutralized. And what you have at the end of the day is, is that the sodium ions are now more inside the cell than outside of the cell. So the cell, inside of the cell, assumes a, a net positive charge compared to the outside of the cell. And now there's also, immediately that happens, there's, um, uh, a desire to neutralize even that action. So because the outside of the cell is now negative relative to the inside of the cell. So immediately the sodium ions move out again to neutralize the negative charge outside of the cell. And so this action continues. And when, when this happens from the initial negative potential to the sodium ions coming in, assuming a positive charge, and then to them coming out again, what we have is a pulse. We have an electrical pulse with a certain amplitude that is generated. So, and this continues, and this is the action that we call depolarization, which I have said you should uh, associate with the contraction of the heart. Now, when the sodium ions leave the cell, which is about minus 90 millivolts, which is what is effectively inside the cell, inside the cell at the start. Now, now the, the pulse that you have 
is what you now call action potential. You call there are several action potentials that make up the ECG signal, and uh, we're going to see that in a minute. So we have all of this going on depolarization and repolarization of the entire heart, and this can be measured uh, on the skin surface using special measuring tools. For this to happen, you know, I've put a few pictures there. This one in particular, you will see that this, these are electrodes because for you to measure ECG signals, you need to attach electrodes to certain parts of the body. So you can't just place them anywhere. They have to be in certain parts of the body. And then um, they are able to measure this change in action potentials at every point that it is happening. And that's why you now see what we call an ECG signal. So I have put here a, a few um, diagrams to show uh, how, because for uh, an ECG device, it depends on what, uh, on how the device is. Some, some are, sometimes you can even have a watch that has an ECG measuring um, ability. Sometimes it can be a, a handheld device. And sometimes it's a very big machine. Sometimes like the ones that you have in hospitals. The standard number of electrodes that an ECG machine should have is 12 electrodes, but that is for big machines. Sometimes you just, uh, you, for the handheld ones, you just, maybe they have three, three, um, three electrodes. Um, you just have three electrodes, some have five electrodes. For example, if you see this man here, there are five electrodes attached to his body. And then this is a type of ECG machine we call a holster monitor. This can measure ECG. It's attached to the body. It can me measure ECG uh, signals for 24 hours. So you can sleep with it. If they want to monitor you overnight or maybe throughout the day or for a week, you know, this is what the kind of de uh, ECG device that they use is called a holster monitor. So you can see here, we have four points for the electrodes. That's, this means that it's repeated here, the right arm, the left arm, left leg. This is for three electrodes. The, the, so there are different variations. For here, you can see these are nine. Here, this is like oh, the heart. And then this is like six, like you have here. These are the positions, V1 to V6. That's what you have here. And then the three here is at the back at the scapular point at the back. And this is the spinal cord. They are just using this to show the spinal cord that these are the positions you need to put this uh, at the back and these are the three representing it. So there are different ways to put the electrodes. So it depends on the level of information you want to get uh, from, from the ECG signal. So the less electrodes you, you use, the less uh, amount of information you will be able to deduce from the ECG signal. Okay, so now let's just watch another video. And I want you to be able to relate this because this is the ECG signal we're looking at. So you can see that there are different parts to an ECG signal. Here you have the P wave. That's the P wave. You have the R wave and you have the T wave. In essence, you call the whole of this the P, Q, R, S, T, um, signal that is how it is labeled and this video will show us how the the contraction and the re relaxation of our hearts correspond to the signal that we see here so let's just watch the cardiac conduction system consists of the following components the sinoatrial node or sa node located in the right atrium near the entrance of the superior vena cava. This is the natural pacemaker of the heart. It initiates all heartbeat and determines heart rate. Electrical impulses from the SA node spread throughout both atria and stimulate them to contract. The atrioventricular node, or AV node, located on the other side of the right atrium near the AV valve. The AV node serves as electrical gateway to the ventricles. It delays the passage of electrical impulses to the ventricles. 
This delay is to ensure that the atria have ejected all the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. The AV node receives signals from the SA node and passes them onto the atrioventricular bundle, AV bundle or bundle of his. This bundle is then divided into right and left bundle branches, which conduct the impulses toward the apex of the heart. The signals are then passed onto Purkinje fibers, turning upward and spreading throughout the ventricular myocardium. Electrical activities of the heart can be recorded in the form of electrocardiogram, ECG, or EKG. An ECG is a composite recording of all the action potentials produced by the nodes and the cells of the myocardium. Each wave or segment of the ECG corresponds to a certain event of the cardiac electrical cycle. When the atria are full of blood, the SA node fires, electrical signals spread throughout the atria and cause them to depolarize. This is represented by the P wave on the ECG. Atrial contraction or atrial systole starts about 100 milliseconds after the P wave begins. The PQ segment represents the time the signals travel from the SA node to the AV node. The QRS complex marks the firing of the AV node and represents ventricular depolarization. Q wave corresponds to depolarization of the interventricular septum. R wave is produced by depolarization of the main mass of the ventricles. S wave represents the last phase of ventricular depolarization at the base of the heart. Atrial repolarization also occurs during this time, but the signal is obscured by the large QRS complex. The ST segment reflects the plateau in the myocardial action potential. This is when the ventricles contract and pump blood. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization immediately before ventricular relaxation or ventricular diastole. The cycle repeats itself with every heartbeat. Okay. So um, we can see this is the the wave p q r s t and we've just been told how these are formed we're going to uh, this is a normal wave this is when a heart is functioning well this is what you you should see but you also need to know that sometimes we have ecgs we have quirky um ecg signals um i call them quirky because they are not um they, they don't represent all of the parts that should appear in an ECG signal. So I have several samples here. Uh, for example, um, no, the, the, the strongest part of the ECG signal is the Q, um, the Q, R, and S. You will see that the S part is missing here. We call it the QRS complex. That's what they call it. So here, the S part is missing. Here, the Q part is missing, but nonetheless, they are still all uh, QRS complexes, just that some parts of it are missing. So when you see that, you, you are able to know that, yes, it's still present, but some component of it uh, is missing or there's some abnormality in the heart that is making that to happen. So um, we're gonna, I want, I want us to do an exercise. Um, Okay, so we're going to do some, we want to be able to identify some of these things when we see them, because I know we're still going to have projects and uh, it could help us in some way because we, we are familiar with what we're looking for. Okay, so this is the first example and we have a signal. You see that this it's going up, so don't worry. This is a, I'm, I'm particular about QR complexes here. I'm not looking at, because you could also have abnormal P waves. That's your, the P wave happens when the atria is contracting. 
that's when the atria contracts. The peak, the QRS complex happens when the ventricles are contracting and the T, the, um, the T that, that you saw in the, other, uh, in the other wave, the normal wave is when the ventricles are repolarizing. That means when they are relaxing. So basically that's an explanation of the ECG signal. But here we're not looking, we're just looking at the QRS complex. So um, if you want to, to label this, I'll, I'll just show you the first. Now this is going up, meaning that this is an R wave. It goes from here to here. We are not looking at the P parts, it's just from here. And not even the Q. Now this is, this is the R wave. And it's rather small for an R wave. And then from here, we have this thing coming down, which is the S part, but this is quite much for the S. So you'll see that because this is small, it is a small R wave. So we give it a small R. If it were taller, it would be a big R. Now, this S shouldn't be as deep as this. So, but it's, it's quite deep. So we give it a capital S and then it goes back. This is the isoelectric line. It is the baseline where nothing happens. Along this line, we assume that there is no electric current, sorry, electric, uh, no voltage. Now here again, we have another R wave. We shouldn't be, but we do have it. And we call it, it's an R wave, it shouldn't be there, but it's there. So we call it an R prime and it's also small. So we give it a small R with a prime. Now, the second one, let's see. I'm just getting you familiar with the number because we're going to do a number of exercises. Um, so here we have, you can see this is quite different. The R here is quite different from here. This is quite a tall R wave. And so we give it the R, the big R, capital R. It comes down but it's not really getting down to where it ought to be. So this is a small s. So that's the s part. And then it goes up again. And then that's another r. And the r ends here, which is also a big r. So we give it an r. But because it's, the r is, is happening again, we shouldn't be. We give it an r prime. So I'm going to show you in the next slide, a few of this. So um, I've set up the pull everything again. So please, I'm going to activate, oh, sorry. I'm going to activate that now. Let me just hide this. Uh, okay. So um, let me go back to my activities. So, the first one, I want you to label the signals. So you're going to label this, let me activate it. We'll just do a few. I just want to test your knowledge. Please, can you go to the website and um, put in the answer that you think? I'll just give you a few uh, seconds for this. The answer that you think is appropriate. Just put in your answer, okay? So we can see that. So I'll go back. Let's do another one. Um, the second one is this, let me activate that. Please go and put in your answer. Okay, that's okay. Cool. Okay, all right, means let's go back and do another one. We'll see the answers uh, in just a minute. I just want us to, okay, that's, uh, so let's do another one. Okay. Oh, that seems to be stable now. All right. 
Okay. All right. Let's just do the last one. <laughs> Uh, you know whether your answer was good or not. Okay. I don't think I've activated this. Let me activate it and see. Okay, so now I've activated it. Okay. All right. Um, for those of us changing our minds, I think we have it. It's a bit stable now. So let's go back. Uh, yeah. All right. So I'm back on my slides. So you, we've done that. Before I go to the next slide, um, can I just take a screenshot of this? Because you're going to do E, F, G, and H on your own. Just use it to practice. Take a screenshot with your phones and then we'll see whether the answers were picked. Uh, all right, let's see. So these are the answers. This is for you. Just check whatever you did to see whether you got it right or not. So um, yes, so these are the answers. So let me go to the next slide. Fine. So finally, I think this is the final slide. Uh, we, I just want to talk about the benefits of ECG. Now, uh, one of the first things that ECG is useful for is that it can be used to detect um, the possibility of stroke. Um, if you have, if there's a heart problem um, that might lead to a stroke, uh, it could even uncover some past issues with with the heart that could tend a person towards a, um, um, a stroke. So such, uh, such, when you go for an ECG scan, such results would be, you know, when, when you have that scan, you, they'll be able to determine the anomalies just by looking at the ECG, the C ECG signals. Um, so um, then secondly, there are other heart problems apart from a stroke. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask for contribution just towards the end because I want to know whether we understand the differences between these conditions. Now we have, for example, we have the detection of arrhythmias. When we're talking about arrhythmias, an arrhythmia is just a condition where your heart is, is beating irregularly. There is a way your heart should beat. But if it's not beating that way, then you have an arrhythmia. Like I said earlier, it could be tachycardia, it could be bradycardia when the heart is beating um, at a, a slower pace. So all these are heart issues. It could be that there is a heart defect. There, some are born with heart defects from birth. Some, it happens over time. Uh, and um, so when you do a scan, an ECG scan, the, the, uh, the, 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 this, is, the, this can be de detected. It could be a cardiac arrest, it could be a heart attack. There's a difference between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack. And then it could be that there is poor blood supply to the heart. The, these are, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you whether you know about these things and then, um, and so many others. Now for, then generally it might be good to go for regular, ECG scans, just to make sure that your heart is performing according to baseline uh, requirements. There is a baseline for heart performance. So uh, I know we have a, a culture in Africa, we are not too concerned about our health, but this is something that needs to change. Um, we could go for regular scans and see whether there's something wrong with our hearts, especially when we grow older. So, um, and there are a few things that can control how your heart performs. Some of these include lifestyles, for example, I mean, the kind of food you eat, maybe you, you, you smoke or you drink, uh, you know, and, and then sometimes it has to do with your genetic predisposition. So, um, so that's basically the end of, of, of this thing. But I'm going to ask, um, there are I have uh, 
if anyone ha can define for me is what a stroke is, what a cardiac uh, a cardiac arrest is, and what a heart attack is, and then a coronary artery disease. They have these four things here. So I would like if anyone knows what each of this is, the difference, for example, let me ask, what is the difference between a, heart a, a cardiac arrest and a heart attack? Does oh. anyone know? I'm at the end of my slide. <laughs> okay, if anybody wants to um, answer, can you just um, put up your hand and then we'll unmute you? Or would you like them to, to answer in the chat or you want to hear they them? They can talk. I mean, it's better to talk. Uh, we're trying All right. to so if you want, if you want to answer, If yeah. you want to answer, you have just thrown a very big bomb. Those are big questions. <laughs> so. No, because I need to know whether, because I didn't know the difference, you know, or yeah. what a stroke is. Or maybe we start with a stroke. Maybe we just ask, does anyone know what a stroke is? Please, um, people in the house, if you have any idea, there's no stupid answer. We are all just guessing. say no, yeah, there's no stupid answer. You can put up your hands and then we'll unmute you. <laughs> I can't see any hands. Somebody's no, you want to, we, we need to hear you talk. Don't answer in the chat. Please just talk. All right, okay. Somebody has put up his hand. Um, okay, so can we hear you? Mustafa Miftao. Okay. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, uh, to my to the best of my knowledge, I think stroke is the blockage, uh, the death of brain cells, because there is no passage of uh, there is no blood flow to the brain. That's Brilliant. I mean that that's very good. Yes, that's what a stroke is. When the when there is a blockage to blood flow. Um, in the heart it can also happen because it, it depends maybe there's a blood clot somewhere that's stopping the blood from getting to the, to the brain or sometimes it could be if someone has high blood pressure and um and maybe some veins in the brain rupture there's some blood uh, vessel in the in the in the brain rupture and then that that could also lead to a stroke okay thank you so um that was wonderful so does anyone know what a heart attack is Basil Onyekachi, do you want to tell us what a heart attack is? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Ma. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, for a heart attack, um, from the first aid of this lesson I went to, we were meant to, uh, we were told that um, heart attack is when a blood stops flowing to the heart. And why a cardiac arrest is when the heart stops beating for a while. Excellent. I mean, that's exactly what it is. So what, you have it, not you anyway. <laughs> uh, people have <laughs> cardiac <laughs> people have cardiac arrest when their heart stops beating. You definitely, you know that's serious. So something has to be done immediately. Then for the heart attack, it's also serious because that it means that there's some form of blockage. To, to blood reaching the heart. The heart is under attack. <laughs> That's what it means. So blood is not, it, this could be like, it also could be like a blood clot. It could be something with the artery. Sometimes you, you have, um, you know, so it could be some form of blockage that is not allowing blood to get to the heart. So the heart is under attack, that you call. Uh, so the last one is coronary artery disease. What do you think that is? Anyone able to say something? Coronary artery disease. Okay, quickly, that is when, you know, the, the, the arteries that supply oxygenated blood to the body or to the heart, if to the, to the heart in particular, if, if, you know, sometimes because of, uh, that's um, plague. There's something they call plague. It builds up. It could be due to, due to fat. It could be due to um, maybe um, some of the things that we ingest, like when you take too much salt um, in your diet. It could cause plague to build up within the arteries. 
and then it continues building up. And then at a point, it can even block the passage of blood within the artery. So you are, you are, you are, you are, when that happens, the heart is denied of oxygenated blood, and that's very serious. So that's what a coronary artery disease, or what it means. So yeah, so I've come to the end of my lecture. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm ready to take questions if we have them.